If you have a Bible in your hand, would you please open to the book of Job? I want to read chapter 1 and then chapter 2, verses 1 through to 10. It's a lengthy reading, but please bear with me. As I read, if I don't read, you may not get the context very well. And let's spend some time. Church, look at me, brothers and sisters and friends who are here. If you're away in the morning, I did say that when we come to extremely important passages in the Bible, I tell people to remove everything that they know. I don't think there is anyone in this hall who does not know Job. Remove all that you know. Let's read afresh the word of the living God. There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. But when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their heart. Thus, Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a edge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and it will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. When he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned all the sheep and the servants and consumed their all. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. Hmm. And it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. 
And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, all that a man has he would give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and I will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which he scraped himself where he sat in the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Amen. Psalm 121 is a song. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the Lord who's made heaven and earth. And he will not suffer thy foot, thy foot to be moved. The Lord which keepeth thee, he will not slumber nor sleep. For the Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade. I'm struggling now. Upon thy right hand, for the sun shall not smite thee by day. Yes, Lord. Church, please sing, please sing. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. By the time I'm through with this sermon, will you be able to sing that song again? What is the worst storm you've been through? What is the worst storm? What are you presently passing through now? What are you passing through now? When the storms of life stares at you right in the face, storms that they are like sinking mud with no escape. What have you gone through in your life? What are you going through at the moment now? Let me help you, church. Debilitating illnesses, life-changing accident, trauma, economic hardship, loss of job and livelihood, poverty, injustice, ongoing and recurring sin, grief, crime, pastoral loneliness. Come and ask pastors in London. Pastoral loneliness? The local church is not growing? Death, your father and mother are dead, your children are dead. How are you coping? How are you going to cope? How does the gospel of Jesus address our fear of hardship, calamity, and loneliness? Deadline was September 2017. A man visited his very sick mom. This man lives in Europe. He began to weep silently. He just received a WhatsApp message. Your mother is very ill and on the verge of death. He jumped into the flight, arrived at Lagos, went straight to his mother's house and saw his mother almost dying. 
He helped her for two weeks because he had to return back to England. He went back to England. The mother was still very, very sick. He did all he could to make sure that his mother lived well. Then on Sunday, 29th of April, 2018, at about 6 p.m., this brother has just finished preaching the eschatology of the day of the Lord when a WhatsApp message came on his phone, your mother is dead. He jumped on the next flight to Nigeria and went straight to the mortuary where his mother was on the gunny. He saw his mother's body on the gunny, lifeless. He touched her head, stone cold. He muttered to himself, oh mom, oh mom, you are gone. And tears flowing down freely in his eyes. He raised up his hands and sang, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh my soul, praise him for his thy health and salvation. All he who hear, now to his temple draw near. Praise him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, oh let all that is in me adore him. All that at life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the amen sound from his people again. Gladly, for hey, we adore him. Are you constantly, my brothers and sisters, wondering where the almighty God is and why he is very silent? Are you like the prophet Habakkuk in Habakkuk 1? Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not answer me? That's biblical. Habakkuk was perplexed just as you and I. And you may be perplexed this afternoon too. We ask the question, why is God not doing something? We feel lonely. No, no, no. We don't feel lonely. We are actually lonely. And in this loneliness, we cry out, where is our Abba, Father? Brothers and sisters, there is no where in the Bible. If you have, please show me. And I would apologize because I know you won't find it. So I won't apologize. There is no where in the Bible where we are promised a life free from difficulty. Nowhere. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible. I am particularly speaking to believers here. I am speaking to those on the Lord's side. You may face persecution. You may suffer sickness and even death. You may lose loved ones. You may carry the weight of attack from the adversary. You know the late Martin Luther, the German reformer, he wrote that very popular hymn. I love that hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. In the first stanza, Luther describes Satan thus, For still our ancient foe does still to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with a cruel eighth on earth is not his equal. Our enemy, brothers and sisters, listen carefully. Our enemy seeks to discourage us and plant seeds of doubt in our head. He attempts to sabotage our faith. And in doing so, he tries to undermine the power and the position of God in our life. And this is the reason why the first two chapters of Job is a proper text this afternoon, my brothers and sisters. The title of the sermon is God's Sovereignty and Suffering. And I want to preach very quickly on the three subheadings. The devoted Job, the sovereign, the suffering Job, and the thanksgiving Job. Did you get it? The devoted Job, the suffering Job, and the thanksgiving Job. Let's do the first one. Chapter 1, verses 1 through to 12. Let's take a fresh look at this man. I know you know it very well, but let me help you to have a clearer understanding of Job. Job, I'm preaching in present tense, so you know what, what I'm saying. Job is blameless. Job is upright. Job feared God. He turned away from evil. He had 10 children. A lot of livestock, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, <laughs> many servants, the greatest man of all the people of the East. There is something very striking about this man. Each time his children had a party, Job would offer offerings to God in case one of them had sinned. He was a very upright man. 
Brothers and sisters, this does not mean that Job was without sin. No, 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 no. Do not get that text wrong. What it means was Job had spiritual healthiness. Like Brother Osinachi had said in the morning, Job was a very wealthy man. Job was a real man like you and I. I have heard some people say that Job was a myth. Job is not a myth. He was a man like you and I. We then read in chapter 1 that the adversary is permitted to cause chaos. But we must be conscious that Job is not aware. You see, the reason why you don't believe this text is because you've read page to page. So you know the story very well. Job is not aware of what has been planned for him. When you read without understanding, it helps you to have a clearer knowledge. Job did not know that Wahala was coming. He didn't know. He didn't know. Job didn't know. Job never knew that there was a discussion about him. This man is just devoted to God. In Nigeria, I have heard people say in the last few days, stay in your corner and I stay in my corner, no trouble. You guys say that a lot here? Stay in your corner. Job was staying in his corner, worshiping God, enjoying fellowship, sacrificing all that he has to the glory of God. If only Job knew what was coming to him. If only Job knew. And each time, brother, each time I read this text, I shudder at the calamity coming. He didn't know. He didn't know. Many of us here today in this hall, we are devoted like Job. And this is painful. And we must explain the text so that you may have a clearer, better understanding. We are serving the Lord in the little corner of the world where he has placed us. As professing Christians, we know nothing but Jesus Christ crucified. We evangelize the gospel. But this does not mean that we are immune from the attack of the devil. It doesn't mean that. The devil deliberately and with premeditation, premeditation attacks us. He attacks us because we belong to the Lord. That is the reason. He attacks us. He is armed with a morbid hatred for those who are on the Lord's side. He disturbs your devotional prayer life. Do I have a witness here today? Am I the only one struggling with the devil? He attacks you. He attacks your devotional prayer life. He causes discord between me and IB. IB is my wife. He causes discord between me and IB on a Saturday night so that I can't preach well on Sunday. I'm truthful now. Hybe and I would not have issues Monday to Friday. Saturday night there is trouble because the devil is attacking me so that I may not preach on Sunday very well. The aim is to get you upset so that you don't enjoy fellowship on Sunday. It is on Saturday that I will receive a text message from my family in Nigeria and they would upset me. So that I don't enjoy fellowship on Sunday. Job was devoted. Job honored and sacrificed all to God. Brothers and sisters, look at me. It's in the high. I've also heard the statement in Lagos. It's in the high. How is your devotion to the Lord? How is your devotion to the Lord? How is your involvement with the local church where the Lord has placed you? Can God identify you as honorable? Is the devil upset because you are diligently serving the Lord? Let's look at the suffering Job, verses 13 to 19. We see from verses 13 to 17 where the loss is narrated to us. But let me draw you back to, to verse 3. Do you have the Bible in your hand? Note down now to verse 3. Look at verse 3. What does this statement mean, church? Job was the greatest of the people of the East. He was blameless and upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. One who feared God and turned away from from evil. What does this mean, church? What does this mean? Job was a God-fearing man and his business dealings would have been par excellence. Church, listen carefully and my friends and brothers. If Job was blameless, because if you don't do the text very well, I will not be able to help you to understand what is suffering. If Job was blameless, it can only mean one fact, one fact, 
that you can never lay, Brother Sinachi, a claim of dishonesty against him. Never. Never, never, never. If Job was blameless, you cannot call EFCC for him. Never. If Job was blameless, you cannot take him to court for fraudulent dealing. If Job was blameless, Allah will not go knock his door. Never. He was, he was an upright man. Upright man. If Job was, was blameless, he would not have issues with inland revenue. What do you call it here? Federal inland revenue? You will never have issues with him for tax evasion. The Punch newspaper, I love the Punch newspaper. The Punch newspaper cannot publish a front page editorial about him for using tax avoidance scheme. The question is, how did Job receive the news of his loss? How did he? Because when you read this text, you don't say he lost that, he lost that, he lost that. Let's move on. Please don't move on. Don't move on. Read the text very well. We must allow the Bible to breathe so that you can have a better understanding. Church, listen very carefully. 500 yoke of oxen, right? The first servant rushed to him and told them that 500 female donkeys. Job would have said, bad credit. I will replace them next year. Yeah, bad debt. Let's go. I still have 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. Okay. Let it be. We will do better next year. Leave it. Bad loss. I will ask the accountant to do the books and we move on. Next year will be better. As I read this afresh, I screamed, no, no, Job, no, Job. If only you know what's coming to you. You see, Job did not know. Job did not know. We also do not know, my friends. Look at me, please. I'm begging you. I know it's hot. You've had lunch. Please don't sleep. Listen carefully. I'm struggling with this text now. I'm struggling. We also do not know when calamity is coming. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know, but God knows. Brother Eliza has helped us. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day he's done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Then the second and the third loss of 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels were the evidence that brother Job knew that his livelihood was gone. Please pay attention. I'm begging you. That was when he knew. You know, in Nigeria, I, I'm learning to say all the languages. This is when you know. That's 40. I don't know what's happening. Help me. Yes, sir. Ah, thank you. I've been praying to God for help. Amen. <laughs> I was struggling. Then the second and the third loss of 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels were the evidence that his livelihood was gone. I'm learning a new, a new word now in Lagos where, where my nephew and, and niece were saying, they were just playing with me and then he said, ah, uncle, Casaladon Bosto. I was in shock. <laughs> I said, what did you mean? He said, that means there is trouble. I said, Kassala. I said, what's Kassala? I said, K-A-A-S-A-L. He said, Kassala, don't bust, uncle. Bust. <laughs> Kassala has just busted for Job here. Big time. Big time. The wealth that made him the greatest man on earth is now gone. You read that text wrong, then you will go home struggling this afternoon. The wealth that made him the greatest man is now gone. Let me amplify this in 2021. Listen carefully. With our global technology, the news of his calamity would have been broken on Twitter. I've just seen that Twitter is not working in Nigeria. Would have been broken on Twitter. Millions would have retweeted it. Photographs would have been posted on Facebook and Instagram. The most wealthy man on earth 
has lost everything. <laughs> News helicopters would have been hovering over Job's residence. Job did not only lose material wealth, he lost his children. He lost his children. Brothers and sisters, please look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. What's worse than that? Oh, Pastor Peter, what's worse than that? He lost 10 children. He lost 10 children. To lose a child is a big thing. My first child died on the eighth day. And I buried her on the eighth day. The Lord gave us strength. But I know the implication when you lose a child. When my father had, my father is late now. When my father had, my father fainted in the hospital at Luth. But God gave us strength. My mother held my hand and said, go and do another one straight. To lose a child is big. To lose 10 in a day is a lifelong trauma. Don't read Job next time with fun fear. Please, I beg you in the name of Jesus, don't read Job with fun fear. To lose one child, to lose 10 is mental illness for the rest of your life. That is why the best book to go to for suffering is my brother Job. You see, don't read the Joban text. Theologically, we call it the Joban text. Don't read the Joban text just as mere reading. This is devastating and critical life situation. This is no joke, my brothers and sisters. This is no joke. How do you feel? Church, look at me, I beg you. How do you feel when your child is sick and in the hospital? There are mothers, yeah? I've seen a few mothers with children. How do you feel when your child is sick and in the hospital? Not to talk of the child dying. Now, multiply this by 10. I remember when I was a teenager in Nigeria and I had typhoid fever and I almost died. My late mother took me and my dad to a private hospital in Suruleri where they looked after me and I was coming in and out of consciousness. I didn't know. They had prayed that maybe I was going to die. I was told that my mother looked at my ravaged body on the bed. Now I'm very big now. Then I was very slim. So and there was no meat on my body again. My, my late mother told me when God restored me that Wale, I couldn't bear to look at you on the bed. And I was just praying for strength because you are my only boy and my last born. Job's children were not sick. They were not sick. They died tragically on the same day. Don't ever read this text with fanfare. Ten children in one day. Perhaps Job saw them in the morning and by evening time all were dead. Gone. Gone. And if, as if that was not enough, then the devil returned again to God and asked him for something more sinister. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. Skin for skin. Brothers and sisters, skin for skin. Where are the choirs and the brothers on the system? Skin for skin. Did you get that? Look at chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. So Satan went from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with lotsome sore from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And Job took, I'm struggling now. And Job took a piece of broken pottery with which to, to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. I want people regularly, I want people regularly to pay attention to biblical texts so that you don't miss important clues. I'm happy that this church is Christ-centered and my brothers here would help you. But pay attention with their help. Go back home and also study like the Berean Christians. Pay 
attention to these two verses. Chapter 2, 7 to 8. Pay attention. Do you know what it means, church? Do you know what it means for your body to have sores with pus in them? It's also called pus, boys, pus, P-U-S, with pus in them. Do you know what it means <laughs> to have the pain? You see, that loathsome, L-O-A-T-H-S-O-M-E, is actually the word for painful, for painful. That word, painful, in this text, is like the pangs of childbirth. You know when your wife cream, ah, the baby's coming, push, push. That is the process here. I'm trying to explain to you the suffering of brother Job. Emphasis, all over his body, he had sores. There were, there, were no, there were no free space because the devil said skin for skin. Every part of Job's body was covered in sore. His back everywhere, the pubic area, everywhere of Job was covered with sores. Church, have you ever, when I was in the hotel last night, I had one. Have you ever had this very bad itch on your back where your hand can touch? And then you go to the edge of the wall and you do like that. I did that last night at the hotel. Job had saw that brother Osunachi, his hand cannot touch. His hands cannot touch. Don't play with this book. Don't play with this book. How do you feel when you can't scratch your back? Where is Job's wife? Where is Job's wife? Last night, my dear sister Joy brought food and we put it in the car. Where is Job's wife? Who is scratching the back for him? Job's wife asked him to curse God and die. This, the wife couldn't help with the calamity. She couldn't cope. She is exhausted. So Job is now walking alone. And that is how we've always read the text. Thinking that Job lost everything. This is what the devil always wants you to think. That there is no longer hope for your situation. I will help you now. Watch me. Job lost everything, including his children. But God spared his life and four servants. Four servants. There is always one person to come and report. Okay? All of them don't die. Oh. Now only me remain. Yeah? Four people. Four people. Don't forget the four servants. Don't forget them. Because we, we read in, in, in verse 1, in chapter 1, verse 15, verse 16, verse 17, verse 19, of the escape of the four servants. When you think that you've lost everything, and you've also lost the endearing comfort of your wife, you like Job, you still have four servants. They may bring the bad news of the death of your children, but God has spared them to give Job a clue. The darkest part of the night is just before the break of dawn. Job had treasures as we have seen. Church, I'm not talking about money here. Money is nothing. Money is nothing. Money is nothing. To those who are on the Lord's side, to those who truly believe in Jesus Christ, money is nothing. I'm not talking about money here. No, 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 church. No, no, no. I'm talking about the peace of God that passes all understanding. Church, do you get that? The peace of God that passes all understanding. What do you say when you look at the loss of Job and God's promises of plenty? How, how do you reconcile this? Brother Eliza, Please look at me. That Job lost everything in the sovereign will of God. <laughs> that you've thought of in the morning. That Job lost everything in the sovereign will of God. God in his own word gives a good profile of Job in Job 1 verse 8. Have you considered my servant Job? 
that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Therefore, look at me, church. Therefore, the, the ability to have possessions, the ability to have possessions and to enjoy them is a gift from God. Please pay attention. The ability to have possessions and to enjoy the possessions is a gift from God. When God grants you the possessions, the worship goes to him who is the giver and not the gift. You see, my, my boys, <laughs> they have an understanding when we sit our, at our dining table that the jollof fries in front of them is not prepared by their mom. It's prepared by God. That is how we've trained them. That the Lord has given mommy the ability to make jollof fries and fry dodo and put chicken in it. And the jollof fries may cease at any time. Ah, you are not getting it. The jollof fries may cease at any time. Not because we've done anything wrong. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and praise. For you have created all things and for your pleasure. It doesn't mean that God is wicked. It doesn't mean that God is wicked. It doesn't mean. You see, we must never, church, listen to me. We must never have an unhealthy relationship with the gift that we have been given by God. Professing Christians should never have a disease called affluenza. You know flu. Flu is common cold. Yeah? You should never have a disease called affluenza. Affluenza is two words. Affluence and flu. It means an unhealthy relationship with your resources. Believers must never have an unhealthy relationship with your gift that you've been given from God. The gift belongs to the Lord. I'm going somewhere. Listen, follow me. The prerogative remains with him when to give and when to take it away. Ah, oh, you don't like me again. The prerogative remains with him and God is sovereign over suffering. God is above all things. God created all things. God sustains all things. Many of us, many of us believers, we are, we are easily, easily distracted when things go wrong. Easily distracted. And we sometimes shift our focus from God to the gift. We sometimes forget that God has granted the gift God demands your high allegiance even in your suffering. God, God, God demands your worship even in suffering. He demands your worship even in suffering. Nothing should, should be more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing should be more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, we come to the last of Eden. The times given Job. Chapter 1. 20 to 22 and towards the end. This is where I'm going to spend a considerable time. Please, for, please allow me. In Job chapter 1 verse 20, we read the physical display of this thanksgiving when Job fell to the ground and worshipped God. Church, let me help you, brothers and sisters. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped God. He fell to the ground and worshipped God. Church, look at me. How do you respond when trouble befalls you? How do you respond? How do you respond in the midst of a storm? I'm speaking to believers here. How do you respond? A, a few months ago in the UK, I preached a sermon from Mark chapter 4, 35 to 31, titled, Peace Be Still. 
And I had three subheadings in verses 35 to 36. I preach peace before the storm. In verses 37 to 38, I preach peace during the storm. In verses 39 to 41, I preach peace after the storm. I know it is very hard, my brothers and sisters. We never want to be troubled, but sometimes the boat of your life will be rocked. The boat may look like it's going to sink. The damage as a result of the bone rocking may be permanent in your life. Let us now look at how Job responded when, it was, when he was informed that his children are, are dead. All his children, gone. Job stood up. He tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped God. This is what Job said. Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. These are strong sentences. We must never gloss over them. I need to explain it to you and explain it very well so that I don't do a disservice to the gospel here this afternoon. Let me fillet the phrases. You know, you know, I don't know if you guys have it here. When we buy fish from the fishmonger, they fillet it for you and remove the bone so that you can have it whole without your bone. When you take a carving knife and you fillet your, your tilapia fish, I want to fill out that text now so that you can get an understanding when suffering comes to you. Job rose up. He tore his robe. Shaved his head. These are the traditional practices in ancient Near East. Mourning is biblical. When my mother died. You know the story that I shared at the beginning? I am the boy in that text. <laughs> Morning is biblical. But the part that we need is the worship. Is the worship. Job worshipped God. Brothers and sisters, listen very carefully. It is not easy to worship God in the face of debilitating illnesses. You are looking for money to pay hospital bill. I know. I'm practical now. I know. I know. Job worship God. It is not easy to worship God in the face of trials and challenges and persecution and prolonged trauma. I know, I know, I know, I know. I am not insensitive. I know. It is not easy to worship God in the face of a cruel age from Satan. I know. But as believers, we take our cue from Brother Job. The initial response of Job is powerful. And this is what I want to teach you this afternoon. Our initial responses to trials, challenges, and persecution, they matter a lot. They are the fulcrum and the background on which you will stand when the matter is prolonged for a lengthy time. Only God can help us. Only God. Only God. And this is the reason why we must never have an unhealthy relationship with God's gift to us. You see, you see, the Lord, the Lord has helped me. And I'm praying that the Lord may help you too. The Lord has helped me to see my wife as a gift from the Lord. I see my children as gift from the Lord. So if it pleases God to take my children and wife, and I don't meet them when I go back to Europe, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I will continue to worship him and worship him. I would mourn them. I would mourn their losses. But I will give thanks to the Lord that the Lord give it and the Lord take it. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Only God can help us. And that is the reason why Job dropped this. Naked I come from my mother's womb. Naked I return. You see, to fully understand what Job is driving at here, you must go into the labor room with me now. Come into the labor room with me now at the local hospital. So I am taking you now literally into a labor room at the local hospital here in Abuja where a new baby is about to be delivered. Babies are born naked and many of them, they are right crying for food. There's no food where they're coming from. Job wants us to know that if we arrive naked, 
then life and his merriment should never be above God. If we arrive naked, then God must take all the glory and the honor and the adoration. If we arrive naked, then life itself is a gift to you from God. You see, the oxygen that we breathe, the oxygen that you breathe in, is a gift from the Lord. And we also return naked. Job is saying here, we come naked, we return naked. A baby does not struggle for food. The mother will feed him or her. And likewise, a dead man does not know what's happening to him. Responsibility falls on his family to bury him. If you don't bury him, smell go kill you now. We are dust. We are dust. Once the oxygen is removed by God, we are nothing. Job, Job in chapter 12 verse 10 says, in his hand, in God's hand, is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. The power of life and death, brother, brother, brother Eliza has helped us. The power of life and death is in the hand of the Lord. The Lord gives and it takes away. Brothers and sisters, listen very carefully. God is in total control. Total control. It may seem, especially, especially, I am sorry to say this. The kind of Christianity that we practice in Nigeria demeans the God of the Bible. And we must begin to teach our people right. Chot, listen. It may seem that the devil is winning, or he has won. And some of the songs that we sing in Nigeria demeans the gospel. God wins all the time. All the time. The devil has never won. And this brother helped us in the morning. There is no competition between God and the devil. Never. It's impossible. It's impossible. He can never win. God wins all the time. There is an evil name like that, God win. God wins all the time. Israel, Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. And in one movement, God rescued them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the fiery furnace. And in one movement, God removed them. He allowed Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den and he saved him. He allowed Joseph to be sold into slavery. But what was meant for evil, God meant it for good. God's ways are not our ways. Brothers and sisters, pay attention. William Cowper, if you don't know him, William Cowper wrote songs. He helps us to understand a bit about God. I love William Cowper so much and his ministry. God moves in a mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and rides upon the storm. I particularly, Pastor Peter, I love stanzas four and five. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense but trust him for his grace behind a frowning eh? behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face his purposes will ripen fast unfolding every hour the bud, the bud, the flower bud the flower bud may have a bitter taste but sweet will be the flower Brothers and sisters, here is the comforting part. We must always look at the bigger picture. Look at the bigger picture of God's redemption plan. Jesus Christ has come to save us from the clutches of sin and death and hell. From heaven he came and sought us to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought us and for our life he died. In redemptive history and in the context of Job, God is walking behind the scene. He is walking behind this thing. He is walking behind the scene. It seems as if God is powerless. But in the grand scheme of things, we see what God has done. He has given us Jesus Christ. When we think that all hope is lost, Jesus Christ came into our world and granted us salvation. No matter what the devil may do to us, we are free from condemnation. 
In our challenges, we look up to Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We look unto him for help. Jesus Christ told his disciples in context and also in wider application in John 16.33. When you get home tonight, open your Bible to John 16.33. In this world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. If you know your Bible very well, the next chapter, Jesus did a priestly prayer. What else do you want? What else do you want? Brothers and sisters, how does, how does this sermon help you as you return to work on Monday? How does this sermon help you as you go back to school on Monday? How does this sermon help you as you stay at home as a wife or as a husband? How does this sermon help you as you are doing your NYSC or you are just working in Abuja? How are you helped by this sermon? Do you have a stressful situation in your life? Do you? I was sharing with Brother Sinachi in the morning about a stressful situation in my extended family. Because whatever affects my extended family affects me. The Almighty God knows. He has given us his assurance through his word. He has given us the Bible. The problem is that we don't read the Bible. We wait on Pastor Abutu to help us on Sunday. Yes, that's part of his job. But your own job is to go back home and read that which you have been taught. It is the perfect and complete book to us. We've been given the Holy Spirit. He resides on the inside of us. Draw nearer to God in the reading of your Bible. Satan is very intense. Church, please look at me. I have a few minutes left. Maybe about 10 minutes and we will close now. Satan, Satan is very intense in his assault. Because he knows that he's not going to win. Ah, I am helping you now. Satan knows he can't win God. So what does he do? He gets you drained with the worries of life. So that you may distrust God. Brothers and sisters, I speak to you now amid the wreckage of this sinful, crumbling world that our total confidence and hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith is grounded in Jesus Christ's love for us. And because of this, we remain unshaken by the assault of this world. Let everything fail. Let everything fail. Jesus Christ stands sure and grounded in the Christian life. Let everything fail. Jesus Christ stands sure. You see, the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, professing Christians, listen carefully, quote, professing Christians are generally at their best when they are in the furnace of affliction. You get better when you suffer as a Christian. Ah. You see, church, look at me please. We have many tunnels in the UK, many tunnels for trains. When a train goes into a tunnel, when you travel from Calais to France, when you travel, sorry, from Dover to, to, to Calais, it's on the underground. So you are going on the underground, on the underground of the English Channel for about 40 minutes. When you pass through a train in a dark tunnel, you have your ticket in your hand. You don't jump out of the train and throw away the ticket because you can't see your front. You sit still and trust the train driver. When you go through turbulence in the air, you don't jump out of the plane <laughs> and say, pilot, I will meet you in Abuja. You trust God in the pilot's life to help you fly the plane to Abuja. It is the same way we trust God that no matter what happens, no matter how dark the situation may be, God is right there with me. God may give us a total silence. He may not even respond for years. 
be assured that God's, that God's silence is not a sign for weakness. He is the almighty God. I want to beg you this afternoon to trust him and trust him and trust him. We pray constantly, church. We pray constantly. And I think Brother Eliza made allusion to that. We pray constantly that we may know the will of God. Do you know the will of God in the life of a professing Christian? 1 Thessalonians 5.18 is the will of God. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of Jesus Christ for you. And as I turn the final corner in this sermon, I point you to the suffering Jesus Christ, the good God-man who has to die so that an extremely bad man like me may live. Only the man of sorrows can adequately and efficiently help us. Only the sympathizing Jesus can help us. All your sins and your sorrows, all your walking alone and your sicknesses, all your loneliness, all your struggles, all your joblessness, all your persecutions, they pain into oblivion at the pain and suffering that Jesus Christ went through. Oh, Jesus Christ walked to the cross with sorrow. They crucified him. Jesus Christ endured this and entrusted everything to the hands of the Lord, the Father. Jesus Christ did not walk alone. The Father and the Holy Spirit walked with him. So when he was arrested, he handed it over to the Father. When he was slapped to the Father, when he was nailed to the Father, when he breathed his last, he said this, Father, unto thy hands I commit my spirit. Why did Jesus commit himself to the Father? He knows that God the Father is going to vindicate him. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is our righteous standard for suffering. Jesus Christ is our righteous standard for suffering. He helps us in our suffering. He helps us. Jesus Christ with his suffering and death and resurrection, he raises the bar high for suffering. The question is, is this bar too high for you? No. Jesus' standard, is it too big for you? No. If Jesus has not taught, listen, you can write this down. You can write this down. If Jesus has not gifted you the capacity to suffer, it will not be written in the Bible. Did you get that? If Jesus has not gifted you the capacity to suffer, it would not be written in the Bible. This is why I know that the Holy Spirit is here. Because the song I'm about to sing is a song that we have sung earlier on. And the brothers who planned the program did not know that I'll be singing this song. They didn't know. Though Satan should buffet, the trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul do you know the meaning of the english word buffet b u w f e t it's a military word that is why when you sing that song know what you are singing that word buffet, not buffet, buffet is the same spelling. Buffet is a military word meaning to strike violently and repeatedly. Ah, that's the meaning. The Christian race is repeated warfare. Ah, brothers, you are not getting it. Sisters, you are not getting it. The Christian race is repeated warfare. The devil will never leave you alone. He will never leave. Because he knows you are going to heaven. The devil wants to steal your joy of salvation. Not your salvation. He can steal the salvation. But he can take away the joy temporarily. 
so that you are you are very gloomy, you are very unhappy, and, and you are sinking in the depression mode. I see many Christians and they've lost the joy of salvation. The Christian race is repeated warfare. The devil will never leave you alone. He will strike you violently. But we have a friend in Jesus. Frail children of dust and feeble has frail. In you do we trust, nor find you to fail. Your mercies are tender. I'll firm to the end. Our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. I was sharing this morning with my brother about the struggle in my own family. And I'm here today preaching to you. Life is hard, I know. Life is hard. Please forgive me. The Christian race is hard, I know. But I'm begging you to trust him. Trust Jesus. Trust him. I'm sorry, Chot. I'm sorry. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. You are not alone. You are not alone. And this is a comfort that we have as, as believers that Psalm 120 verse 1 helps us. In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard my cry. Will your hand cold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tide lifts and the cable strain, will your hand call drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fast into the rock which can not move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Brothers and sisters, trust him. Trust him. When grief presses you hard to the dust, worship there. Worship there. You may lose everything. One day, decay will be slain by glory. One day, your faith will become sight and you will see Jesus Christ on the throne. And that thought is enough for me. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Brothers and sisters, the Lord will hold you strong to the end. Amen.